I have a problem with a master orchestrator in you know the, the 15 or 12 people that vote on the FOMC that they actually know the right cost of interest rates. They don't, and they cause massive problems in the economy. But they actually serve to price out renters from the real estate market once again. It's one of those you know, unintended consequences. They say, well, we're going to take interest rates to 0% to save the economy because the economy can't function in a free market capacity, which is completely anti-capitalist done again in nature. I mean, the market, the beautiful thing about the market is millions of people voting every day, having the power and the freedom to decide what the cost is and the, of everything, especially the price of money. You know, savers and investors, that dynamic is completely obliterated. And so the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And here's one a great example. Some people call maple syrup liquid gold, and they think that putting it on pancakes and waffles is an idea that's pure gold. Well, in Miles Franklin, we think a pure gold idea is taking real liquid gold and turning it into real solid gold Canadian maple leaf coins. That's why right now, for a limited time, we're offering the purest gold Canadian maple leaf coins at just $105 US over spot. That's four nines of the purest gold there is in a pretty maple leaf design. And at only $105 US over spot, we'd say that's an idea that's pure gold. Call me directly at 419-819-9209 or my associate at 310-562-6400 or email us at kaiser at milesfranklin.com. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We have a returning guest, Michael Pento, that when I don't have him on for more than a few weeks, people start telling me, you got to have Michael Pento back on. So here he is. He's back with us this Tuesday, March 23rd, 2021. Michael, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Always a pleasure to be with you, Dunnigan. You're very interesting to our guests because you're an active money manager and you study the markets intensely and you're looking forward. You always got this forward-looking approach and that's what they're thinking about too. And one of the things that occurred to me to ask you about today is the, the debt and the uh, money printing that's been going on by the Federal Reserve and, frankly, all the central banks of the world. But a lot of the clients who call me about precious metals, for example, are later career stage or retired. They've lived a significant portion of their life. They've gained a lot of experience, and they know the importance of balancing one's budget. They know that you can't just, as a household, you can't just go on and go on and go on with an imbalanced budget, spending more than you're earning and uh, accelerating that, in fact. So how is it that this is able to happen at the national level and where is that leading us to? So could you talk to us about your view of the importance of balanced budgets and what happens, what's happening right now in our country with the uh, currency printing and the debt expansion that we're undergoing right now? Okay, so... Um... I guess what households are missing is a printing press in the basement <laughs> and the world's reserve currency. That's the thing I it, forgot to do. You know, it, it wouldn't be so, you know, if spending more money than you have in income wouldn't be such a problem if you had a way of just printing money like Al Capone. So uh, since we don't have that and we don't have a world's reserve currency behind us, then we have to be much more cognizant of our income and our spending. But look, you know, we are abusing, the United States is abusing itself of this world's reserve currency status as much as possible. I mean, at record proportions. You know, I was doing some research in a commentary a couple of weeks back, and the first five months of fiscal 2021, which starts in October, our deficit is 68% higher than it was the year prior, which was no, you know, example of fiscal prudence. Um, and... Uh, Let's see, that is, I think that's 16 and a half percent of GDP. Now, bear in mind, a deficit that's 16 and a half percent of GDP is way higher than any deficit outside of 1943 to 1945, uh, where we had 20 percent debt to GDP. 
And even in the height of the Great Recession, our deficit as a percentage of GDP was less than 10%. It was like 9.7%. We're at 16.5%. And what I, what I find most um, troubling is that we're supposed to be you know, coming out of the recession and we're supposed to have nominal GDP growth of year-over-year -year growth of around 7% this year compared to last year. And why are we running deficits that are 16.5% of GDP? And these deficits are in the context of interest rates, borrowing costs, that are 2%. The average borrowing cost for the Treasury is closer to 6 to 7%. We're borrowing at 2 and we're And if we're borrowing at 2 and their deficits are much higher than any, much higher than at any other time in history outside of that two, two, those two, three years of World War II, end of World War II. What's going to happen when interest rates normalize? What's going to happen to these debt and deficits, especially as the government waxes towards universal basic income and modern monetary theory? So, um, as you can see, it's it's absolutely paramount, paramount, Dunnigan, that you have an actively managed strategy when you approach your investments because. If you want to hold a balanced portfolio of, you know, 60% stocks and 40% bonds or some kind of combination like that, and both are in a massive bubble, you're in a huge problem. And if you don't believe that, open up your statements for this month. Open up your statements and see how far you are down on your bond portfolio and how far you are down on your stock portfolio. Because you're down on, especially if you're overweight in your equity portion in NASDAQ stocks, especially those that were geared towards the stay-at-home trade. You're, you're in a world of hurt. So both assets are in a bubble. You cannot have bonds act as a ballast to stocks and vice versa any longer. Right. You've talked to us in the past about how some of the, the, in contrast to your style of active money management, people who are getting sort of the cookie cutter, standard retail financial planner, you know, the ones that are in the strip malls all over America telling them, you know, 60 percent, 40 percent stocks and bond portfolio, you'll be fine. Um, remind people where that leads to in the environment that we're currently in. Does it look good for a while? And then what happens? I, you know, I'm having a, my phone is ringing off the hook here, to be honest with you. And I think the, the epiphany reached um, sort of in the year 2018, 2019 was that our government, and indeed all the governments in the developed world, don't have a viable plan for the economy or for markets. So, you know, let's, let's look at the Great Recession, took interest rates to 0%, supposed to be a once in a lifetime occurrence, then we're gonna normalize quickly out of that. You know, I think we took seven or eight years to get above 1% on the Fed funds rate, and so you're talking about a decade after the Great Recession started, the economy and the markets blew up again in 2018. You remember the taper tantrum? You remember that that was in 2013. But if you remember the quantitative tightening tantrum, you remember that we raised interest rates to 2.5% on the Fed funds rate and the economy fell apart and the stock market fell apart. So I think people understood, especially now after the COVID uh, crisis, that the government has no viable plan. Their only plan is lower interest rates, borrow a ton of debt, print up a ton of money. Don't forget that number is $6 trillion of borrowing and printing from March, 2020 to March, 2021. $6 trillion of stimulus, 5 trillion of which will be printed this year, by the end of this year, 5 trillion printed. So print a bunch of money, borrow a bunch of money, send asset bubbles to the moon, and then they, you know, they tried to tell us, Dunnigan, that they're in control and they can ease themselves, extricate themselves out of this mess. And they can't. It's blatantly obvious that they cannot do that. And perfect example is how we started this, this interview. If you took interest rates back to normal, we would be paying 35 percent of our, our debt. Our deficit, our annual deficits would equal 35 percent of GDP. I mean, that's something that not even the most banana-like republic could endure. You know, so it's not going to work. It's not sustainable. And you're going to have to trade these deflationary booms and infl uh, 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 deflationary busts and inflationary booms correctly. That's absolutely paramount. 
We have a question here about booms and busts. Uh, Dr. Vaughn's Life Investing says, do you see the market to continue to be inflated up or will a real estate bubble burst and bring it all down before the end of this year? Okay, so you'll you'll give me a little time to answer this question. Absolutely, hope, because it's a long, it's a long answer. So, so um, maybe you you are aware. My clients are certainly are aware that we are investing right now in pension portfolio strategies for an inflationary cycle, a a boom cycle to occur. Uh, the year over year growth rates that will be announced in May. So the April year over year growth rates, those base effects that will be adding into the um, picture come April. And announced in May, retail sales, non-farm payrolls, GDP, you, you, any economic in, indicator, uh, consumer prices, will be absolutely booming in that April-May time frame. And we're invested towards that. Now, we, this past week or so, we see um, a rebalancing. The quarter ends, as you know, in a couple of days, and there's some rebalancing going on. So they're they're selling uh, some of the high-flying stocks, the, the, the um, industrials. Uh, the small cap value, some of the banks that are being sold. But I, I think this is a temporary phenomenon. Then we're going to go right back into the meat of the, the sweet spot of this boom in inflation and growth in, in the May-June time frame. But after that is when you know active management is going to even prove itself once again to be so valuable because you're going to see the base effects decline. And that will be about the time you see much higher interest rates. But don't forget the interest interest rates the year a year ago were 0.3 percent on the 10 year. Now they're 1.7 percent. And they're going to, in my opinion, they're going to two to two and a quarter. Not by the end of the year, by the summertime. That's my opinion. That's what I believe is going to happen right now. So much higher interest rates, much higher rates of inflation, and you probably will get a tax increase too sometime in the summer. So higher taxes, higher interest rates, higher inflation. And that's going to lead us right to the edge of this fiscal and monetary cliff, which is inevitable to occur. Remember, I said there were six trillion borrowing year over year, March to March, 20 to 21. Much of that was front end loaded. This is all, you know, sugar. It's a sugar high. So we just had 1.9 trillion passed. Those checks are still, are, you know, not even really going out yet. They just started to go out. But then the second half of this year, you're going to have a fiscal cliff like we've never seen before. Even if Biden gets the three trillion dollar stimulus package passed, which he's now floating, that's going to be over a decade. So you say 300 billion a year is nothing compared to. 1.9 trillion in checks going to state and local governments, to businesses and to you know corporations and to people, individuals. That's what's happening now, and that's what happened last year. So there's a big trenchant gap, fiscally speaking, but it's also also going to occur right about that same time, where we're going to hear the announcement from the Fed that hey, once again we were successful. Don't worry about QT. It's like watching paint dry. Don't worry about raising rates. Don't worry about anything because the economy is now healed and on a self-sustained path. Well, that's a monetary cliff of epic proportions because you're going to see the tapering of $120 billion a month of mortgage-backed securities and treasury purchases just at the wrong time because that's you know we have supply coming on the market ad infinitum that's just going to it's going to overwhelm. The private sector without the bid of the central bank. And what price, what yield does the public demand on a 10-year treasury note? Let's just think about this, Dunnigan. Let's just say I'm, I'm correct and the government is correct that we're going to have nominal GDP around 6 or 7% later this year. Well, throughout history, the 10-year treasury, the benchmark treasury note, yields commensurate to right around nominal GDP, which is growth plus inflation in gross domestic product. We're at 1.6, 1.7%. So, you know, you, you talk about yields that I believe the par private sector is demanding yields to approach nominal GDP. Now, even if nominal GDP does contract 
back to where it should be around trend, say around 4%. So 2% inflation, 2% growth. 4%, we're at, you know, we're not even half that way to that level. So I'm looking for much higher interest rates, much higher taxes, much higher inflation, and then a fiscal and monetary cliff, which is going to mean that Penta portfolio strategies which will most likely switch from a uh, defensive strategy that's hedged against inflation to one that goes towards bond and bond proxies to head against disinflation. The question that I, I don't think there's much of a question in my mind if that's going to happen or not. I think that's absolutely going to occur. The only question is how bad does the disinflation deflation get? Do we get just a rapid deceleration in growth? That's pretty much guaranteed. But does it decline to the point where we hit a recession slash depression where, um, yeah, you can own gold, big, big buyer of gold second half of this year, big buyer of bonds and bond proxies second half of this year. But does the deflation and recession cause a liquidity crisis, which will cause you to exit gold, which will cause you to buy only short term treasuries, only go long the dollar and go short the market? That's a big question. You have to watch credit markets very closely for that. Um, that's a long answer. But no, no, no. But I, to, I, I was I waiting to, to hear you also mention real estate. Could you please dis, uh, discuss real estate? Because the, the original questioner had asked about that. And now we have okay. a follow on. <laughs> I'm going to get one in here. <laughs> a follow on from Phil Aubrey, who says, what does Mike see for real estate by the end of the year? Does he think the Fed will be able to keep their promises of lower interest rates for longer? You've already touched on the interest rate portion, but talk about the impacts on the real estate. So, Market. So scenario, so scenario one, which is the base case that we just get a deceleration in growth, which would be great for bond and bond proxies, also be wonderful for real estate REITs to own. That's the caveat. There would be if the problem would be if we get that credit crisis, if that liquidity withdraw starts to cause a spike in the high yield junk bond market. Uh, if you see a spike in LIBOR rates. Um, the break-even spreads begin to collapse. You you could get a problem in all asset classes, not you know, not not just stocks in in real estate as well. So it all depends on the intensity of the deceleration. But for now, I believe real estate will be a, a, especially you know high high dividend yielding REITs would be a great buy. Not now, second half of 2020. Yeah, a lot of people have been watching and waiting from the sidelines, wondering when to get into either precious metals, when to get into you know purchasing real estate or not, or whether they should be selling their home now if, if this is the, you know, some places where people are overbidding. I think you and I were talking just before the interview about a situation with involving overbidding on, on uh, and seeing prices going up in the real estate market. Some people who own real estate are wondering, should they sell now while the selling's good or is this going to be sustained? This 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 glowing time of uh, seller's market going to be sustained for a long time? You're saying it it all depends on the intensity of the uh, change in in interest rates and and other factors that that could either go gradually or or go fast. So there's no doubt we're in a real estate bubble. You look at home price to income ratios; they're almost back to the absolute apex they were in 2005. So could we get a slow you know leak out of the bubble? That that would be my hope, but I, I don't invest on hope. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Just it's a, we talk about so many things, you know, V-shaped recoveries, L-shaped recoveries, K-shaped recoveries. Now we have a, a slowly leaking bubble. <laughs> That's a new one. That's good. Okay. Well, I mean, and by the way, I, I'm, I'm, I've been in business 30 years, almost 31 years. They're, slow leaking bubbles are almost um, unheard of. They're very, very rare. Um, I, again, as I, the best case scenario would be for a slow leak in the real estate bubble. Um, but I have, my, I mean, I, I believe that there is, you know, a very high risk. My base case scenario is that hopefully that we just go to a slow deceleration in growth. But, you know, I'm wide awake here understanding that this could get the, uh, the unwind of this credit bubble could and very well possibly should be violent in nature, at least for a truncated period of time which I think would bring, help bring real estate prices down to earth. You know, I just wrote a commentary as an aside about the Fed as, they, as being a killer of freedom. You know, think about what the Fed is ostensibly supposed to be doing. And, you know, and even now, you know, 
uh, preaching about egalitarian socialist principles about, you know, we, we, we need to make the economy more equal and, you know, everybody should be, you know, in the same kind of middle class, you know, uh, it, punish the rich and, and help the poor, which I have, no, I have no problem with that. But I, I have a problem with a master orchestrator in, you know, the, the 15 or 12 people that vote on the FOMC, that they actually know the right cost of interest rates. They don't. And they cause massive problems in the economy. But they actually serve to price out renters from the real estate market once again. It's one of those, you know, unintended consequences. They say, well, we're going to take interest rates to zero percent to save the economy because the economy can't function in a free market capacity, which is completely anti-capitalist done again in nature. I mean, the market, the beautiful thing about the market is millions of people voting every day, having the power and the freedom to decide what the cost is and the, of everything, especially the price of money. You know, savers and investors, that dynamic is completely obliterated. And so the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And here's one a great example. Uh, can you imagine going to try to get a mortgage with a 20% down payment on a starter home? You got to come up with, you know, 120,000. If you live in New Jersey, where I live now, you have to come up with $120,000 of a down payment. If you look at the, the average cost in a decent, I'm not talking about a beautiful home, I'm talking about the starter home. Uh, especially in the town that I live in, you won't get hardly anything for that. Um, so, you, you know, let's just let's just all understand that even though the Fed purports to be an entity that espouses equality and and fairness, they destroy freedom. That's what they do. You mentioned along the way about um, the bondholders and when is the right time when bonds will, will look attractive or less attractive depending which way the interest rate goes. We had just had an interview with Alistair McLeod and he's concerned that as the Fed uh, tries to perhaps institute yield curve control by driving down the, the long end of the, of the curve by buying those bonds that it will make those bonds with low rates less attractive to uh, current foreign holders of U.S. debt that with the with the uh, bond valuations propped up temporarily by that artificial suppression of long-term uh, rates, and I hope I'm getting this uh, right, that, that there would be an incentive for more, to accelerate the selling of U.S. Treasuries by foreign uh, holders. Uh, do you see a risk that, that the Fed trying to, you mentioned bad things can happen when you don't let Mother Nature take its course and let people vote freely with their with their pocketbook and so on, including the cost of money. Do you think that with the Fed uh, intervening through yield curve control and trying to pull down the the long end of the of the bond yields uh, will dis, will accelerate uh, foreign dumping of U.S. Treasuries? So there's so much to, as they say, unpack <laughs> there. Um, so right now the Fed is doing yield curve control. Let, let's make no mistake about it. They're not explicitly capping long-term rates, but buying $80 billion a month in treasuries is definitely controlling the yield curve. There is no doubt about that. So the question is, will they cap long-term rates? Well, right now we just heard from Mr. Powell. I mean, in his, um, you know, they say ignorance is bliss. You know, he says, well, you know, um, right now it's wonderful. Let's let long-term interest rates rise because this is a sign of a healthy economy. So we'll pin short-term rates because they're geared towards the Fed funds rate at pretty much zero, right? Virtually zero. And then we'll, you know, let the long-term rate gracefully rise higher. Um, the problem is that, as I just laid out before, interest rates, if they were to be uh, market-based, the 10-year, no, I'm just talking about 10-year, I'm not talking about the 30-year, I'm talking about the 10-year, would be closer to 6% this summer. Um, now, what, what do you think, what shape do you think the real estate market would be, the stock market would be, uh, the credit markets would be if, if Mother Nature was allowed to act prudently? So um, I think that there's a possibility that Powell, you know, ex post, retroactively, tries to cap long-term interest rates. And your question is, well, will that discourage uh, buyers uh, overseas? And the question, you know, the answer there is, well, don't you think they're doing the same thing? Don't you think you know, the ECB is saying the same thing? 
Um, Japan was making some tacit threat about letting interest rates normalize. Believe me, Japan is the last place that they can ever let interest rates normalize. So they'll all be doing the same thing. But the primary driver, here's the to answer the question, the nucleus of the question. The primary driver for interest rates is the second derivative of growth and inflation. If you get that right, you'll most likely, I can't guarantee anything, but you'll most likely get the direction of interest rates correct. And I believe you're going to have a, de a rapid deceleration of growth in the second half, 2021. But before we get there, before we even talk about that, we have to get through the non-farm payroll reports that are going to show one million jobs hired in the leisure and hospitality sector. That's coming in the next couple of months. So, you know, I'm, I hope I'm not overstaying my welcome in the uh, reflation trade. I'm watching it carefully. But then we're going to have deceleration. And I think long term interest rates will become a buy. Right now, I'm short them. Um, because we are, again, accelerating. We are, we are going to accelerate growth and in inflation rates on a second derivative basis, the fastest in history, in recorded history, in the next couple of months. What, to, what, to, what, you know, to what extent is that already factored into prices? That's the question. I don't think completely, but they're clearly, they're clearly a, a good chunk of them are. And then it's imperative to start buying bond and bond, I think, bond and, and bond proxies, bond and bond proxies in the second half of 21. Related question, you mentioned about how the uh, Fed monkeying with interest rates can affect the attractiveness of bonds. Uh, also, what about on the the, the uh, fiscal, the spending side? Uh, Jeff Barber says, would Michael think that it will, what will happen in terms of foreign entities dumping treasuries if the Biden three trillion dollar next stimulus passes Congress. So it's this spending aspect, too, that we're, you were talking, you were addressing that earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, so, you know, that's part of the reason why I am still short bonds. I mean, we're just we're, we're I don't think it's going to pass until the uh, probably June time frame. Um, there's a lot of things going on, especially in Congress. Now there might be uh, attacking the filibuster, especially because of this uh, second mass shooting in the United States, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's a terrible tragedy, but um, the Democrats do want to take your guns away. They, for some reason, blame guns instead of the real issue is, you know, why do Americans want to mass murder people so so often? Well, that's the real question. I don't want to get off on too much of a tangent, but that would be that would be my way of addressing the problem. But the filibuster, they can break the filibuster, just make it a 50-50 decision. They can probably, you know, uh, ban your AR-15s. So. That's probably going to take a lot of oxygen out of the room in the short term. I think probably early summer is when we can get the three trillion passed. Uh, it's a tremendous amount of supply coming not only from the 1.9 trillion, uh, the rollovers from the six trillion that we just passed. The deficit now uh, is, like I said, six, over almost 17 percent of GDP. You've got 37 trillion dollar national debt. Um, so that has to be rolled over. There's a tremendous amount of rollovers in, in, in that calculation. And when I when I say 37, I mean the national debt. The total debt of the United States is 100. I think now 107 percent of GDP. So it's absolutely, you know, um, outside of World War II, it's never been higher, and continues to climb, you know, inexorably. So yes, that's a lot of supply coming on. Which of course, you know, it, you, either the Fed buys it or interest rates spike. And if the Fed starts to threaten to taper, then you can get that super spike in rates that I'm predicting, followed by that crash in yields. Sorry, I had a little pause here. Um, in the past, you've talked to us about how you see um, metals factoring into your overall strategy as we go through this very eventful year. Uh, can you update us on your latest thinking so that people can uh, know your your mind and your your approach and your philosophy around how metals factor into, I guess, a part of people's investment portfolio ever and in any situation and specifically at this time. So um, everybody should know that I sold the miners in the fall of 2020. I sold very early this year all all of the in the portfolio not personally, in the portfolio, the physical metal, 
because the prediction, which then come to was a prediction back then, but then came to fruition, that real interest rates would be rising and rising quickly. So the, the, the paramount calculation when you want to decide if you should overweight gold in your portfolio, I'm not talking about that 5% physical goal that I recommend that everybody have just as a store of wealth. And you can give that to your progeny. So um, you have to you have to determine what is going to be the direction of real interest rates. And if nominal interest rates are rising faster than inflation, then you will get a rise in real interest rates. And that was the that was the be all and end all of the calculation. And 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 I think in the gold market, a lot of people get it wrong and they start thinking about, well, look about what about the dollar. Um, which is, by the way, is a crowded short right now. Um, well, what about the, our deficits? And, and what about the debt? And what about you know China? You know maybe a conflagration between China and India, or China and the United States. Th- those are ancillary factors. They're they're important. I don't overlook them. But the primary determinant of what to do with precious metals is to determine the direction of real interest rates, which are still in the process of rising, but should begin to fall in the second half of 2021 as the fiscal and monetary cliff hit. Isn't that counterintuitive to a lot of you? You know, people could say, well, wait a second, you know, the QE is $120 billion a month. Why the heck are you, that, that's why you should buy gold. No, because growth is accelerating as well as inflation. And that brings nominal rates higher, faster than the rate of inflation. Um, that, if, if you can get that dynamic right, then you get the precious metals right. And that's why I think, um, again, counterintuitively, once they end QE, remember, I want to just tell you, if you can remember back to gold's, the gold market's last peak, which I think was 2011, 2012, which was the beginning of a collapse in the miners, they dropped 85% from 2011 to 2016, 2015, 2016. So it was absolute, you know, Armageddon for um, us gold bugs. Um, but Bernanke, the chair back then, was initiated on QE at $85 billion a month, unlimited, for unlimited duration. But that was the top of the gold market because, not because, the Fed was printing so much money that didn't cause the top in the gold market because growth was returning, albeit anemic. The big problem with growth, which was in the wake of the Great Recession, was starting to come to an end. And we had several years of anemic growth, but growth and deficits came down sharply. So that is the that is the dynamic you, ha- you have to look for. And if you get that right, you'll get the precious metals right. So it's all about watching the uh, real interest rate and watching for the relative uh, growth versus inflation. It's challenging for most people because what what numbers do they trust for inflation? Can you talk to us about how people should keep an eye? What what numbers do you trust for it? Well, I I use I use the, the five year forward break even spread as the proxy of what the market is not not what not what Mr. Powell says inflation is. I look at what the market believes inflation is headed. Give us so, that again. Where can people find that? Five-year, 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 five-year forward break-even spread. You can look at break-even spreads, and if you Google that, you'll find it. Uh, one of my factors in the 20-point IDEC model, inflation, deflation, economic cycle model, is break-even spread. So, um, so if you if you look at that, that's that's your calculation for inflation. And if you obviously you can easily find out what the 10-year note's doing, um, but you have to also predict where the 10-year note's going to go. And if you get those two things right. You'll, you'll find that you'll, you'll get the real interest rate correct. And uh, I think that uh, in the second half of the year, you'll see nominal rates fall faster than the rate of inflation starts to decline. Real interest rates fall. There you go. And you buy gold. And by the way, these miners, some of these miners have really cleaned up their balance sheets. I can't wait to get back in them. It'd be a wonderful time to buy some of these miners. It's just not the right time yet. I mean, it, look, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this say, well, you know, I have no idea what I'm talking about. But but go back to what I said and then watch what happened. And then maybe I have a point. You know, it, it, it all depends on your per, on, on your um, your primary purpose of investing. Do you want to be philosophically correct 
and lose money or do you want to make money in every cycle? Well, I, I run I run this uh, RIA like a, it's an SMA separate from managed account, but I run it like a hedge fund. So I'm actively trading. I just want to be I want to, every day I ask myself, where is the money best treated today? That's it. That's the, that's the, that's the end of the conversation, the beginning and end of it. Now, you mentioned earlier that you said when we talked about the Fed implementing yield curve control and pushing down or letting go the long end of the curve, you said, yeah, but what are all the other central banks going to be doing? There's a question here from Butch Michael who says, what do you think of all these central banks working in tandem? Do you know of any nations that are outside of this currency besides Russia? Outside of what currency? Uh, this management of... Oh, the regime uh, the of fiat, uh, the fiat currency that the way that most of the world is managing it. Well, I can tell you one thing. It isn't Turkey. I mean, <laughs> you look at Turkey. I think they had four central bankers in the past year. So what, the central banker in Turkey raised rates and he got he got fired. So I, I don't know. If, so I look at the I look at G3 monetary policy. So that's United States, Europe and China. Monetary and fiscal policies of those three um, blocks. And if you understand those three central bankers and those three fiscal and monetary policies, you'll get the important part of the second derivative of growth and inflation globally. So, I, I mean, could you find some, you know, uh, you know, ancillary central bank that doesn't really care um, about manipulating their yield curve? Yeah, sure. But it isn't it isn't it isn't the ECB. It isn't the PBOC. It isn't the Fed. It isn't the Bank of England. Uh, and it isn't any one of 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 consequence to my portfolio strategy. Remind people before we let you go where, what you think they should be watching as a clue for when you're going to be moving back into miners, uh, because there's several questions here. I didn't ask all of them, several questions on investing in, in miners. Yeah. So I would like to see the nominal rate on the 10 year note start to decline on a cyclical basis instead of increase. Um, and I would like to see that um, the Fed make some comments about getting ready to announce the taper. The taper is going to happen in 2022, but at least announce that a taper is coming. Big, the biggest taper we've ever seen in history. Um, and uh, I would like to also make sure that break-even spreads don't collapse. So I don't, I don't want to see the rate of inflation collapse along with nominal rates. That would be a problem for me. So, um, but the best thing they could do, you know, rather than, I mean, if, you don't, if you don't live and breathe this every day, you're, you're not going to get the cycle right. So if you don't have around $100,000 to invest, if you do, you can come here. You know, Pensupport.com is taking a client. But if you don't, you should at least subscribe to my podcast, which is the Midweek Reality Check. It's $49 a year. And um, and you'll get my macroeconomic view of things. You won't get specific investments, of course. I have to do my due diligence on before I make any kind of recommendations. Um, but you will get a, a you know a macro. You'll you'll hear me say something like, "Hey, you know, we went back into the, some miners." You know, you'll get that. So, if people do want to take advantage of your full services as an active money manager, where should they go? So go to the website, pentaport.com, and you can contact us there. You can call the office at 732-772-9500, or you can email me directly, or my assistants here. But you, you'll get, my assistants get my email. So it's mpento at pentoport.com. That's mpento at pentoport.com. All right, folks, and if you don't want to miss a single interview with Michael or any of our other guests, make sure you go to libertyandfinance.com. Over in the left-hand margin, put your name and email address. We'll get you on our free email list so that you get all of our emails, which is three times a week, with all of our interviews, all of our guests, and any links that they provide. And for example, the info on how to contact them, like Michael just offered, will be in our newsletter. You don't want to miss that. libertyandfinance.com, free email. Uh, Michael, as always, on behalf of our guests, just thank you for joining us here on Liberty and Finance. Always a pleasure, Daniel. Some people call maple syrup liquid gold. And they think that putting it on pancakes and waffles is an idea that's pure gold. Well, Miles Franklin, we think a pure gold idea is taking real liquid gold turning it into real solid gold Canadian maple leaf coins. That's why right now, for a limited time, 
We're offering the purest gold Canadian maple leaf coins at just $105 US over spot. That's four nines of the purest gold there is in a pretty maple leaf design. And at only $105 US over spot, we'd say that's an idea that's pure gold. This is Donegan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver dealer with Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized, private service from one of the oldest and best respected companies in the business. 30 years strong, A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau, zero complaints, licensed and bonded, insured delivery or vault storage or IRAs, excellent prices, privacy and confidentiality, pay by check money order, ACH or wire, satisfaction guaranteed. Call me directly at 419-819-9209 or my associate at 310-562-6400 or email us at kaiser at milesfranklin.com.